Wait a minute. Have you heard the strange tales of the whistler? Nita, what is it? What's wrong with you? I don't know. All of a sudden, I, I got a terrible feeling. A horrible feeling of, of foreboding. I'm frightened, Tom. Another Sunday night, and again, CBS presents The Whistler. I, the whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. And so I tell you tonight the unusual story of malice. Dr. Jacob Benton is the wealthiest citizen in a certain upstate county, as well as its most prominent physician and surgeon. Jacob Benton is a proud individual proud of the fact that he comes from a long line of highly successful surgeons. And his greatest ambition is that his son, Tom, will follow in his footsteps and carry on the family tradition. Jacob has also a nephew, Harvey, son of Jacob's scapegoat brother who married a girl from the wrong side of the town and finally disappeared, leaving Jacob to take care of his young son. After finishing high school, Tom and Harvey entered medical school. Harvey followed through and is to graduate next week. But Jacob's son, Tom, at the end of his third year, wandered over to the East Bottoms at the lower end of town and uh, met a girl, lost interest in medicine, and refused to go back to school. Tom. Tom. Yes, Father? Come into the library. What do you want? Where have you been? It's two in the morning. Why, I've been to a party. Where? A house party. On the other side of town? Yes. In the East Bottoms. You've seen that girl, that Nita, again, haven't you? Yes. What of it? What of it? You're a disgrace to the name of Benton. I've told you time and again that you don't belong over there. I like Nita because she's honest and genuine. She's not filled with a lot of silly ideas like Eloise. Eloise is a fine girl. She belongs to an excellent family. Oh, bosh. Eloise is a phony. Nita's a real fellow. If you become serious about this girl, you'll be ostracized. I know. I know all about poor Uncle George. He went over to the East Bottoms and met a girl and went to the dogs. But it wasn't the girl. He was no good in the first place. He was a stubborn fool, just like you. I resent being told who and when and where. Are you in love with this girl? Yes. I'm terribly disappointed in you, Tom. I'd hoped, I'd prayed that you'd become a surgeon. I don't like medicine. You were wrapped up in your studies until you met this girl. That's what you think. I'm ashamed of you. Your cousin Harvey came from the lower end of town. I made him see the light. And then think of it. You about face and walk right into it. You quit school and he graduates next week. All right, his name's Benton, too. Let him carry on. He likes medicine. It bores me. This girl has made a fool of you. Oh, I could kill her. I think I'd better go to bed. Good night. Good night, young idiot. He's going to finish school if I have to... What's all the racket about down here? Oh, uh, come in, Harvey. I I heard voices. Yes, it was Tom. He's been to a party across town. Been out with that cheap girl again, that Nita. Are you sure? He admitted it. Says he's in love with her. Tossing his career to the winds over a woman like that. How long has he been seeing her? Oh, several months, I suppose. That's why he wouldn't go back to school. All she's after is his money. How he ever met up with her, I'll never know. I'm afraid I'm the cause of that, Uncle Jacob. You? What do you mean? Well, when I was home last summer, I went over there one evening, several evenings, in fact. Tom insisted on going along. I wanted to see some of the kids. I went to school with Nita, and, well, I introduced them. Well, of all things, you were born over there, and if you insisted on going back, it was your own business. But Tom is my son. You knew how I felt about it. You had no right to take him over there. I realize that now. Well, something's got to be done about it at once. Yes, but what? I'll put an end to it. Believe me, I'll find a way and I'll stop at nothing. For the remainder of the night, 
Jacob sits in the library studying the problem of what to do about Tom. And upstairs, young Harvey paces to and fro, pondering over the same question. The next morning, Harvey goes to the lower end of town to visit Nita. Hello, Nita. Harvey. Why, I didn't know you were back in town. You didn't? I came home last night. I'm going back in a few days for graduation exercises. Have you missed me, Nita? Why, why, yes. Why haven't you written me in the last month or so? Well, I, I've been busy. Been across town lately? No, why should I? Mm-hmm. You know, it's a strange thing about this section called the East Bottoms. It means more than just a, a place. It's a huge barrier, an insurmountable obstacle. I was born over here, same as you. But I got an idea that I could cross over, and in time I'd be accepted as one of them. But I finally realized that I would never be accepted. I'd only be tolerated. I'd never be able to practice medicine over there. I think that's all imagination. I told you I had definitely decided to come back here and settle down. That's why I asked you to marry me. I'm not satisfied here. Since when? I've never been satisfied here. You belong here, Nita. You'll never be able to cross over. You'd be miserable. I know. Maybe. And Tom would never last over here. He'd wash up, just as my father did. What are you talking about? I know what's happened. You're throwing me over for Tom. What? You're after Tom because you think he'll take you out of this. Set you up on the other side. Well, he won't. You'll have to come over here, and he won't have a dime. You're not really in love with Tom. I am in love with him, and he loves it me. It won't last a month. I'll make it last. Oh, don't be a fool, Nita. Tom's father thinks you're a, a good for nothing, and he'll never change. I don't care. I love Tom. And when it came to a showdown, Tom would walk out on I'm him. I'm going to marry him. I've made up my mind. Then there's nothing more I can say. Goodbye, Nita. Goodbye. That evening, Dr. Jacob comes to a decision, and he too crosses town and makes his way to Nita's apartment. Well, what do you want to talk about, Dr. Benton? About my son, Tom. I see. How long have you known him? Oh, since last summer. Have you seen him often? Yes, several times a week for the last two months. You think you're in love with him? I don't think. I know I am. I don't think he's in love with you. He's merely infatuated. You're interested in his position, his money. You can think whatever you like. I'm familiar with your type. My... my type? What's the matter with me? Are you aware of what you're doing to my son? I've done nothing, nothing at all. You've caused him to drop his career. Tom has a tradition to fulfill. He comes from a fine family. And I won't have him throw it all to the wind because of a silly infatuation. It isn't an infatuation. He must marry someone in his own class. Someone who'll inspire him to carry on his career. I didn't talk him out of his career. He says he doesn't like medicine. The right girl wouldn't allow him to stray. She would encourage him to follow through. The right girl. Family. Tradition. It's all a lot of bosh. Everybody in this town has made up his mind that the East Bottoms mean the difference between somebody and nobody. Well, I haven't. I'm made of the same stuff as you or Tom or anybody else over there. I have a right to a decent existence. If it's money you want, I'll give you money to let him alone. I'll give you a lot more than you'll ever get from Tom if you marry him. Money? You, you'd pay me to give him up? Yes. Yeah. Here's a check for $5,000. $5,000. <laughs> is that all your son is worth to you? $5,000? If he were my son, and I thought I could buy his future, I'd give every cent I had. What? You mean you want more than that? Dr. Benton, you don't possess enough money to buy me off. I don't want money. Well, what goes on here? Hello, Tom. You came just in time. What are you doing here, Father? What do you suppose? What's he been saying, Nita? He just gave me this check for $5,000. For what? To let you alone, so you can continue your career. What? He thinks I'm wrecking your life. He is. That settles it. We'll get married tonight. You won't get married tonight, not in this state. We'll fly over to the island. That's in another state. They don't have the three-day law. Get your things, Nita. If you marry this girl, I'll never give you another cent. I'll get along. Come on, Nita. Tom, I'll stop at nothing to break this up. 
I promise you will regret this moment so long as you live. Let's go, Nita. So Tom and Nita rush out of the house and drive to the airport just outside of town. A storm has come up, and the highway glistens in the beam of the headlights. This rain is certainly like a cloudburst. Maybe we shouldn't fly over tonight, Tom. Why not? I don't like to fly in a storm. How, how can you tell where to land? Oh, don't worry about that. I'm familiar with the field. Who's on the island at this time of year? Well, not many people. We've had this summer place there as long as I can remember. There's an old fellow and his wife who look after most of the places. He's also a justice of the peace. He can marry us. We'll spend the night at our place, and then we'll go someplace else tomorrow. Tom, are you sure you want to go through with this? Certainly. What do you ask? Your father meant what he said. Is it... Is it worth it? To give up everything? You're worth a dozen family fortunes. But, but now that I think about it, it... It... Well, he sort of frightened me. <laughs> he didn't frighten me. Oh, the way he said it made... Made chills run up my spine. Said what? You'll regret this moment so long as you live. Oh, he was just bluffing. But somehow, I... I don't think he was. He can cut me off, but we'll get along. Tom, why don't you finish your studies? I told you, darling. I don't like medicine, and I never will. Why should I do something I dislike just because my father and my great-great-grandfathers liked it? Well, what do you want to do? Oh, I don't know. But I'll find something. Tom? Yes? What is it? <laughs> Nita. What is it? What's wrong with you? Oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> All of a sudden, I got a terrible feeling. A feeling of... of foreboding. Well, snap out of it, Nita. This isn't like you. I know, but I can't help it. I, I'm frightened. Of what? I don't know, but I am. Oh, tell me, turn back. Let's wait, please. Oh, no, you can't back out now. We're going through with this. But he meant it. Your father meant what he said. I know he did. Please turn back. I wouldn't turn back for all the money in the world. <laughs> Now, don't worry. I don't need lights to land. We should have come in a boat. No, it's too choppy for a boat. This is the only way in weather like this. Tom, there, I see a light. Just went on. Yeah? Old Jenkins probably heard it. The, the light is swinging. Yeah, that's it. That's the field. It's a tiny one, but I can make it. There's a light. Yeah. We're all right now. Hang on. I'm going to set her down. I don't know yet. Good thing it didn't catch fire. Oh, who are they? No, no. Hold the lantern down here. It's a woman. Yeah, don't recognize it. Hey, hey, this is young Tom Benton. Oh, the girl is hurt bad. Look at her legs. They must be broken. Yeah. Come along. We can get them over to the house. Phone Doc Benton. <laughs> This Dr. Benton's home? Uh, this is Jenkins over on the island. Is Dr. Benton there? Oh, is that you, Harvey? Well, you better find Doc and get him over here right away. It's young Tom. He tried to land his plane hit some trees. Uh, I don't think Tom is hurt so bad, but the girl has smashed up something terrible. I don't know who she is. Yeah, Goodbye. <laughs> It didn't take you long to get here, Harvey. We've got him over at our place. Huh. Tom 
the world did Tom hit those trees? I had no trouble seeing the field. The lights weren't on when Tom came in. I didn't even hear his motor until it was too late. He should have phoned me. He was coming. Hey, where's Doc Benton? He's out on the case. He left his patient's house, so I, I left a message telling him I was going ahead and to come as quickly as possible. I brought some medical supplies. Here we are. Tom's over there on the couch. They put the girl in the bedroom. Few, few cuts on him. Don't think he has any broken bones. Oh, nasty bump on the head. Maybe a slight concussion. Well, I better have a look at the girl. Looks to me like both her legs are broken. Nita. Oh, poor kid. You know who she is? Yes. Yes, I know who she is. Uh, was I right about her legs? Yes. Both rather badly smashed up. Where were they going on a night like this? I imagine they came over here to get you to marry them. Marry them? Well, I'll be darned. I wonder why they didn't phone me first. They were in too much of a hurry, I suppose. Too bad. She's in a very critical condition. Extreme shock. Better get some hot water and plenty of blankets. Yeah, right away. Get the house as warm as possible and put more blankets on Tom. I'll be right back. Martha? Uh, yes? How is she? Harvey says she's in bad shape. Gather up all the bedclothes and coats you can. Got to cover them up good. Put on plenty of water to heat. I'll build up the fire. Outside, the storm rages on. Harvey sits quietly beside Nita's bed, staring at her in a daze. Her breathing becomes shallow, irregular. A quarter of an hour passes. Then a plane motor is heard overhead. The ship sets down, and Dr. Jacob hurries to the house. Tom's over there, Doc. Tom. Tom... He, he's been unconscious ever since we brought him in. Can't find any fractures. He's got an awful wallop on his head. Yes. I see. Hmm. No apparent concussion. He'll be all right in a short while. Um, get some pillows. Raise his feet. I want his head lower. I'll get them. You certainly got it hot in here. Yeah. Um, Harvey had us do that... Because of the girl. She's pretty bad. Girl? Where is the girl? Oh, in the bedroom there. Harvey's in there. Um, I'll have a look at her. Harvey. Harvey. Huh? Oh. Hello, Uncle. What's the matter with you? Uh, I just... Are you crying? No, no, I... I I'm just... This is a miserable mess. Fine example of a doctor you are. You have to learn to be completely impersonal about these things. Oh, I know. What do you say is wrong with her? Both legs are broken. She's suffering from extreme shock. Uh huh. Better take your bag, go out there and give Tom a shot of adrenaline. I'll attend to the girl. Yes, sir. <laughs> Harvey gives Tom the adrenaline and proceeds to attend to the cuts and bruises. Then he moves to the fireplace and sits staring into the blaze. The storm rages on. And the minutes drag slowly along. Ten, twenty, thirty. Then Dr. Jacob steps out of the bedroom. Harvey. Yes, sir? Has Tom come out of it yet? Not yet. He shows improvement. He'll be all right in a little while. I see. Jenkins. Yes, Doc? Get us something to make a pallet. We'll carry him down to the plane and take him over to the hospital. Sure, right away. I'll get four poles and some rope. I'll have two made in a jiffy. Never mind two. Just one. The girl is dead. <laughs> on the following day, Tom has fully recovered. Gradually, the events of the preceding hours begin to pass before him. The argument, the island, 
The plane. Nita. Nita screaming, and then the crash. And then... Nita. Nita. Where is Nita? Tom sends for his father. But Jacob is already standing in the shadows of the room. How do you feel, Tom? Nita. Is Nita all right? Now, now, take it easy, Tom. Don't get excited. Where is Nita? Forget about Nita for the moment. You've been pretty badly banged up. A little more and you'd have had a real concussion. What about Nita? If you insisted on flying to the island, why didn't you phone Jenkins to turn on the light? He heard my motor. We were in a hurry. Besides, I saw the lights. Jenkins said he didn't turn them on at all. Didn't hear you till just before you crashed. That's ridiculous. Where have you got Nita? Nita is at the undertaker's. She... What? She's dead. Good Lord. Was she... Did it happen in the crash? No, she died about half an hour after I got there. Were you on the island? Yes, Jenkins found you and called the house. I was out on a case and got to the island too late to save her. What was the cause? Her legs were broken. She died from extreme shock. Was there nothing you could do? Nothing. Did you try? I resent that inference. You should know better than that. I'd rather have had anybody in the world there than you. Do you know what you're talking about? Yes, I do. You hated her. You didn't give her half a chance. Will you shut up and stop yelling? What did you give her? I gave her adrenaline. It was probably water. I've heard enough out of you. When you come to your senses, I'll consider talking to you. Good day. <laughs> Now Tom, his mind filled with suspicion, his heart burning with hatred, throws on his clothes, dashes out of the hospital and goes to the island. He reviews the whole situation with Jenkins. Each incident from the time he first heard the plane motor to the moment they took him to the hospital. Tom returns to town, arranges for an autopsy, and is now talking to the autopsy surgeon. Well, Dr. Groberg, how about it? What's your report? Well, both legs were fractured, but there was no compound fracture. There were several minor lacerations about the body and the head contusion. Nothing there that would have caused death? No, no, nothing. What else did you find? Any evidence of, of poison? No, none. She was suffering from shock? Oh, naturally, but uh, not extreme shock. Then, then she didn't die from shock? Death from shock would have been prevented by the adrenaline administered. Then you found adrenaline present? Yes. That is what I can't understand. What do you mean? Well, one of the most difficult things to diagnose is the difference between extreme shock and internal hemorrhage. There was internal hemorrhage? Certainly. And this one was one of the easiest to diagnose I've ever seen. As you well know, adrenaline in internal hemorrhage is absolutely contraindicated. In other words, you think our death was caused by the administration of adrenaline? I do, definitely. But... Those things happen sometimes, regardless of how hard we try. Yes. Well, thanks, Doctor. I'll see you later. Hello, Father. Well, have you finally come to your senses? Yes. Yes, I have. I'd like to have a little talk with you. Very well. What about? I've been doing a little investigating. Investigating? Now, what are you talking about? I'm talking about Nita. Are you going to start on that again? I am. And I'm going to follow it to a conclusion. I don't want to have anything more to do with it. But I do. I've had a hard day, and I don't care to listen to any more of your idiotic babblings. How would you like to have the grand old name of Benton? The untarnished reputation of your long line of surgeons blasted to a thousand pieces. What are you talking about? How would you like to have it known that you, the eminent Dr. Benton, the trusted, the revered Dr. Jacob Benton, deliberately and with malice of forethought, caused the death of a girl. How would you like that? You're insane, positively mad. Oh, no, I'm not. I've gone back over the whole thing. I know you hated Nita. You said I'd regret the day so long as I lived. You threatened to do something, and you did. At your first opportunity... You are crazy. You did everything to separate us. You tried to buy her off. When that didn't work, you killed her. Get out of here. Leave this house. You didn't just let her die. You killed her, murdered her. Get out. I know what I'm talking about. I had an autopsy performed. You what? An autopsy. Go on. She didn't die of shock. What then? She died of a very obvious internal hemorrhage. 
aggravated by adrenaline, which is contraindicated. You're a specialist in that line. You couldn't have made that mistake in a thousand years. But I was positive it was a shock. You knew what it was. No, I, I, I must have been wrought up. I, I could have made that one wrong diagnosis that happens once in a thousand times. Oh, no, I saw the body. I could tell with as little medical experience as I've had. Tom, you, you mustn't say anything further about this. Why not? It would ruin my reputation. Oh, it... now you're worried about your reputation. What's that compared to the girl I love? Oh, but Tom, listen to me, please. Good night. Wait a minute. Wait, Tom. Well, what do you want, Harvey? I heard you. I heard every word. So what? I can't let it go on like this. I can't let you do this to your father. What's it to you? You keep out of no, it. No, Tom, now listen. You're wrong. I know what I'm talking about. Nita was murdered, and I can prove it. Your father had nothing to do with it. Harvey, that's enough. Leave us alone. I won't. I can't stand by quietly and see this happen to you. I won't. Leave this room, Harvey. Don't say another word. Now, wait a minute. What are you trying to say, Harvey? I did it. Your father's trying to cover up for me. What do you mean? He wants to save my future reputation. If it got out, it, it would be a blot against me. What would be? When Jenkins called, your father was out. He told me what had happened. I left a note for your father, took an emergency bag, and flew to the island in, in hopes I could do something. Go on. I, I thought Nita was suffering from shock. I, I was terribly upset because, because I was in love with her. So I gave her adrenaline. I wasn't experienced enough to recognize symptoms of hemorrhage. Is that the truth? Yes, now that he's told it, there's nothing I can do. I knew in an instant it was hemorrhage. When I saw the adrenaline vial, I knew what a terrible mistake he'd made. He was emotionally upset over the girl, and I wanted to give him a chance. It was done. I tried my best to pull her through, but it was too late. But I'm sorry, Tom. Terribly sorry. Harvey guiltily leaves the library and goes up the stairs to his room. Tom stands staring at Jacob, then drops into a chair and begins to sob softly. A few minutes pass, then... A shot. Tom and his father leap to their feet, rush up the stairs and into Harvey's room. Harvey is sprawled dead over the desk, a gun in his hand. And on the desk, a note addressed to Tom. Read it, Tom. Dear Tom, I can't stand it any longer. It's been driving me crazy from the moment I did it. Nita's face is before me every second of the day and night. I was in, in love with her. But when she ran away with you, I lost my reason. I imagined she'd be better off dead. I was filled with hatred. I knew she was suffering from hemorrhage but I gave her the adrenaline in a bit of revenge. Now it's driving me mad. Forgive me, Harvey. Well, that's the end. Another case of jealousy. Another example of the futility of allowing oneself to become a victim of the green-eyed monster, jealousy. <laughs> CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next Sunday, 9.15... I, The Whistler, will return to tell you another unusual tale. <laughs> Good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.